Attention! And welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit. This is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is another, another new one. Can you believe it? There are still more subreddits that I have not done yet. Shocking, right? Anyway, this new subreddit is called r slash military stories. Okay, so there's, there's gonna be some juicy content to be consumed. Are you excited? Because I sure am. So let's get to it. All right, with the introduction of a new subreddit to the channel, let us do what is customary and read from the top stories of the year. And the top story is a good one, judging from the title alone. And it's called, When a trainee telling a drill sergeant to shut the front door goes right. I've been enjoying user Pickle in the Butt stories of his time on the trail, and they remind me of one of my favorite basic training encounters. Sort of, as you'll see. I've told the punchline to this story before on Reddit, but not here and not with all the background. I really hope that somewhere there's a retired drill sergeant who likes to break this story out as one of the strangest things to happen to him on the trail. Prologue. Due to a combination of wildly over-optimistic academic goals and a fear of commitment, my first enlistment was in the US Army Reserves. I wanted to jump out of airplanes and shoot machine guns in order to pay for college, and Uncle Sugar extended an invitation to do all of that so long as I made a six-year commitment to be all I could be, trademarked, one weekend each month and two weeks each year. My IET was scheduled to be about nine months long, basic training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina for around nine weeks, a number of months of IAT at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, all capped off by a three-week visit to Fort Benning, Georgia to enjoy the gentle ministrations of the Black Hats at Airborne School. Through some heinous screwery and MEPs, on the day of my departure, I'd ended up adding another month plus to my IET time, waiting in holdover status for security clearance paperwork to catch up with me. All in all, I was gone for more than 10 months, an important number going forward when things went a bit pear-shaped. Private OP wrapped up IET and finally came home, all fired up and still reeking of that new private smell, <laughs> phrasing, and quickly reported to his first unit. First day of my first drill weekend, I'm called in front of formation and am promoted to private second class, and then again immediately to private first class. I probably still compete for the record for shortest time in grade for a private second class at less than five minutes. After the laughter died down, the commander tells us he has bad news. The unit's being decommissioned and we have to find a new home. Cue sad trombone. Crap! What have I gotten myself into? The options were simple. We could transfer to another reserve unit if there was space, find a National Guard slot if there was space, or terminate our enlistment contracts without penalty, but also without access to the GI Bill and other benefits. The nuclear option was to apply for an active duty slot with the regular army, as it turned out that I quite enjoyed soldiering and was still too broke to afford college tuition. That last option piqued my interest. The problem was this. Everyone was eyeballing the military as a career option. This was the mid-90s and the economy was very uncertain, which meant the job market was crap and the US was still riding high on post-Gulf War one, the golfing patriotism. So, recruiters in all branches of the armed forces were spoiled for choice and going gangbusters in their business. Because my IET extended six months, I was classified as prior service active duty, which put me pretty far down the depth chart as far as applicants went. It took some aggressive footwork and a lot of patience, but nearly a year later, I was able to snag an active duty slot. The build-up. In the spirit of things that make no sense, I was reassigned to an Army Basic Training Battalion, this time at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, along with about 150 other prior service troops to await private change of station orders to my first active duty unit. No joke. As a prior service active duty soldier, one couldn't just slide right out of a reserve slot and into an active slot. We had to be properly re-indoctrinated and the only place we could do that was, apparently, freaking Missouri. Damn. Damn! What have I gotten myself into? 
Here's where things start to get fun. We had all sorts in our company. With 150 or so troops in the company, we had everything from 11Bs to comms folks to personnel clerks to intel weenies like me, as well as a big handful of prior service marines. We even had security force tab sergeant first class and not one but two ranger tab sergeants all of whom were combat veterans of the first Gulf War, or catch and release the Saddam edition. Through dumb luck, I wound up in the same squad, such as it was, with these badasses. Thankfully, the indoctrination process wouldn't require us to actually repeat basic training. While we were officially assigned as trainees, what we were really there for was to redo all of our paperwork, update vaccinations, draw new uniforms and gear, and then hurry up and wait for permanent change of station orders. We lived in the basic training barracks and ate in the basic training dining facility, but were fairly strictly segregated from the actual trainees. For about two weeks, the daily routine involved morning physical training, followed by a generally mindless detail, base police call, raking leaves, etc. And we were usually released after lunch to do whatever we wanted for the rest of the day. Not a bad gig, and inarguably, the only way to enjoy a place like Fort Leonard Wood. Upon drawing new uniforms, we were explicitly cautioned against taking them to any of the off-base cleaners for installation of rank insignia, badges, combat patches, etc. This was back in the day of battle dress uniforms when everything was sewn on. Because our orders could come down at any moment with minimal time to prepare for departure, they didn't want us risking abandoning our new gear. This didn't stop anyone from doing just that because a bit of visible rank was a reliable way of inoculating us from the attention of the drill sergeants, who were still everywhere and not necessarily clued in as to our status. So generally, we each had at least one battle dress uniform top with all the gugaws we'd earned, but our field jackets were almost completely sterile. The payoff. Very early one morning, some of my squad is tasked to prep one of the ranges for actual trainees. We're promised a couple of hours worth of work with the rest of the day off. At about 5.30 a.m. on a chilly October morning, we're corralled into the back of a five-ton truck for the drive to the range. Sergeant First Class Tab Dude is our nominal platoon sergeant, and we have one of the sergeant rangers on board too. It's too early for much joking, but the conversation is light and we're expecting nothing beyond a quick police call, maybe raking some rocks, and then breakfast. What we get is a little different. The five ton lands at the range and immediately we hear shouting. It's gonna be good, gif. The back gate is dropped and a bevy of drill sergeants are there to greet us in their own inimitable way. Flashbacks to basic training. We're too slow for them because screw them, but also because screw them. We're not trainees. They don't care and they start to pick us apart individually. One of them instantly locks on to Sergeant Ranger who's sporting a Ranger role on his patrol cap. Oh, what do we have here? A Ranger wannabe? Who the hell do you think you are wearing your headgear like that, Private? Rebel, rabble, rabble. <laughs> Sergeant Ranger is both irritated and nonplussed. Remarkable, really. It's too early for this crap, and given his service record, it's simultaneously too late for this crap. We're all caught off guard, mouths agape. Sergeant Ranger collects himself and casually drops down from the five ton, and the following exchange occurs. Listen, he begins as he starts to unzip his virtually sterile field jacket until you have one of these points to airborne wings with combat jumpstar or one of these sliding one arm out of the jacket and pointing to his ranger tab or one of these shedding his field jacket completely and pointing to a combat ranger scroll then you can talk to me like that but until then you will shut the hell up those last words vibrated amongst us time froze so to the air around us Tunnel vision ensued and the whiff of a Wild West showdown permeated everything. Drill sergeants froze mid-shout, furiously scrambling to do the mental math to figure out what comes next. A scenario that clearly was not covered in any training block at the Drill Sergeant's Academy. This is fun. Finally, one of the Drill Sergeant's CPU catches up to the situation and he speaks. 
Who? Who the hell are you? Sergeant First Class Tab Dude has quite enjoyed this, but intervenes. He quickly jumps down out of the five ton and introduces himself and us. We're all prior service, Drill Sergeant. On casual status, just waiting for orders. They told us to report here to give you guys an assist. I'm Sergeant First Class Tab Guy, and extends a hand as a means of introduction. The last remnants of confusion settle into the dirt as the situation starts to come into focus. The drill sergeants look at each other and then back at us, and as the resolution improves, so does their demeanor. Some nervous laughter. Well, screw me, one of them says. No one said anything about prior service. They told us to meet here to meet a truck full of soldiers from one of the training companies, so you guys got one of our performances. Sergeant Ranger has made his point and he's not a butthole, so no hard feelings. We get briefed on what we're expected to do and where to find the right tools. The drills see an opportunity for a relatively easy start to their duty day, so they're happy to leave us be. A couple of them jet to the dining facilities with a promise of returning with hot coffee and something to eat to make amends. And that's how I got to see a basic training trainee tell a US Army drill sergeant to shut the heck up and not only survive, but also earn an apology and coffee for it. This was an incredible story. Holy crap. Like the writing, just everything about this. So, so good. The acronyms, I loved them. I don't really do the story rating thing unless I read a really good story and then I think, wow, this deserves something. So I'm gonna give this thing, this story, this amazing story, the rank or whatever the hell, a grade of plus ultra. I want someone who is actually in the military to react to this because Obviously, we all know that drill sergeants have a, a hard-ass media representation, and they're kind of just represented as buttholes in general. From what I've heard, that is an accurate way to describe them, but all my military peeps in the comments down below, first of all, thank you and I love you. Second of all, tell me what you think about this. I want to know how many jaws hit the freaking floor. This story's called, The Time My Dad Went AWOL From The Army Because He Was In Air Force Basic Training. <laughs> Okay, um, this all started in 1981. My dad had always wanted to follow his dad's footsteps and join the Air Force. My dad was eager to get out of his small town, and as soon as he was old enough, he signed up for the Air Force. However, as things were, the Air Force was slow to ship him out to basic for various reasons. After what he says seemed like nearly a year of waiting, he finally caved. The army recruiter had mentioned my dad would get shipped to basic fast and start his career fast. My dad was very much in love with the idea of being the Air Force, but decided he'd rather get out of his small town now than wait for the Air Force. Now, this was before computers may have caught something like this. My dad decided to go down to the army recruiter and sign on up. He was sworn in, signed his contract, etc. The army was moving quick, however, with perfect timing, he finally got his ship date for his Air Force basic training. My dad decided, screw it, it's the same thing, I'll just ship off with the Air Force. So he heads for Air Force basic training. He's about three to four weeks into basic when one day he gets called in to go speak to the commander. Two army MPs are with his commander and his commander asks if he enlisted in the army as well as the Air Force. My dad confirms he did. <laughs> I'm pretty sure his commander was like, what if I? As it's not every day you get to be enlisted in two military branches at the same time. My dad was told he was being pulled out of his class as they figure out what the hell is going to happen. As it's not that common for a soldier to go AWOL because he's becoming an airman. Eventually this gets escalated to a two-star general who, after reviewing the situation, decides that since my dad joined the Air Force first, he technically belongs in the Air Force and the army should just forgive him for also joining the army and drop their AWOL case against him. Since can you really be AWOL from the military when you're sitting in basic training? Apparently, the two-star general got in contact with whoever on the army side was chasing my dad and got them to agree to release him from the army and not consider him AWOL. Luckily, the army agreed. This took several weeks, and my dad was then called back into the commander office where he got a good talking to about the importance of not joining multiple military branches at the same time and the confusion it can cause. 
My dad was then told the army had decided not to pursue the case of him being AWOL from the army any longer, and he would be recycled, which would be considered his punishment. My dad thanked them, promised to never join another military branch while he was still in the Air Force, and went back to his new basic training class and went on to have a successful 26-year career. You know what, that could have gone really bad if the army was a jerk. Or who knows, maybe they could have appealed or something, I don't know. But that's, that's really cool. I don't know how else to describe what happened in this story as anything other than cool, but just wow. All right, this story is called Stranger in a Foreign Land. So I was Marine Infantry deploying to Iraq, and our flight got ganked after we arrived in Kuwait. We got told that we weren't flying out for another two months. Well, naturally, we aren't just going to sit around and do nothing. So we were all assigned base duties and assorted busy work. I got attached to Air Force Security Force to do airfield security. I was the only Marine working in an Air Force unit out of the blue, and this is my story of making contact with this strange foreign tribe. So their tech sergeant goes, Well, you're an NCO and you got combat experience, so I'm gonna have you be SOG tonight. You think you can do it? Okay, says I, I can do that. Well, I quickly set about my task, storming up to each post, demanding a post report, yelling a lot, and generally doing everything an SOG does as part of his job. Then I came upon a post that was apparently unmanned. Oh no, no 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 no, stand the heck by. These lovers were asleep. I jump into the post, remove my helmet, and proceed to begin beating the two airmen about the helmeted head and shoulder areas while screaming profanity at them. I get the post in order, then begin to go back to the security center to report on my post tour. Upon entering, I see several officers and staff NCOs staring aghast at a screen. One female female with a bunch of stripes, I still do not know Air Force ranks to be honest, is covering her mouth in shock. Curious, I peek at the screen to see a ground-based operational surveillance system thermal video of me arriving at the sleeping post and SOGing the crap out of it. They turn and the lady who has the most stripes says, what the heck man? I am intensely confused. In Marine Corps land, I would be getting high fives while we planned the next round of screw screw games for the sleepers. Uh, I'm SOG. That's what SOG does. The room is quiet for a minute. This is the Air Force, man. These guys are reservists. Exasperated, I throw my hands up. Then how the hell else does an SOG do his job? The lady with lots of stripes in a dead serious tone says, you bring the post coffee and chat them up. I forget the rest of the conversation because I think I had an aneurysm or something. During the post changeover, all the airmen are standing on one side of the room avoiding eye contact while I get half the room to myself. Maybe I smell bad or something. No idea what their problem was. Anyways, the tech sergeant apologizes to me for the ass chewing I received and says it's his fault for not explaining the job to me. I explain that said interaction hardly rated as a stern talking to in my world. Then I went to their awesome chow hall and had steak, eggs, and cheesecake for breakfast. I spent another couple of months working for the Air Force and felt like a Viking who had stumbled into some fancy Victorian ball the entire time I was there. I was a stranger in a foreign land. Are the Air Force memes true? <laughs> I love it when the branches talk crap about each other, it's so funny. <laughs> There's all those memes about the Air Force, you know, being pampered and all that stuff. Obviously, pampered is, <laughs> is an exaggeration, it's still military, you're still the Air Force. However, stuff like this is still really funny. <laughs> um, anyways, this story was good. This subreddit's pretty freaking great. And let me end the video by saying thank you to all military servicemen and women. You got your 07 salute from me. <laughs> Even if you might not agree with those in charge of the military that, you know, makes them do what they do, you gotta appreciate all those that put in that work. Unless, according to this, your Air Force. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.